All right, thank you for sticking around. This is the final unofficial event of the national championship. Um, my name is Ian Scheffler. I'm a cuber. I'm also the author of the forthcoming book, Cracking the Cube, Going Slow to Go Fast and Other Unexpected Turns in the World of Competitive Ruby's Cube Solving. If you can say that three times, you get a prize. No, I'm just kidding. And this is? I'm Colin Burns. Uh, I've been cubing for about six years. I'm the former world record holder and the 2014 US national champion. And this is? Uh, I'm Weston. I've been cubing for about nine years. I won nationals in OH twice, had a, an NAR, and, and I still do some OH stuff. And the reason there appears, there are characters in the book, just as some of you in the audience are. Um, so the way we're going to structure this is kind of like an English class. Hopefully you enjoyed some of those. Um, we're going to just each, they're going to each pose a question, and we're going to discuss it, and then we're going to open it up so you guys can ask questions, and then we're going to leave. So uh, here's Colin. All right, so my first question for you uh, is sort of how you got started cubing, because um, I thought that that story that you shared in the book was pretty interesting and unexpected to me and why you were interested in writing this book in the first place. Um. Also, just a tiny bit of background. So um, I'm a writer by trade. I've written for The New Yorker and The Guardian and The LA Times. And um, 11 years ago, I happened to have sat next to Toby Mao, Tyson Mao's younger brother at summer camp. Um, I don't know if any of you have met him. At the time, he was the, one of the best cubers in the world. He had the world record, I think, the following year when it was twice what it is now, like 10-7 or 10-4. Um, and we went to a very unusual summer camp that Lady Gaga and Mark Zuckerberg attended when they were kids. And I wasn't sure what he was doing because he was doing something under the table that looked a little strange. And it turns out he was solving a cube. And um, I fell down the rabbit hole of cubing in terms of learning how to do it. Um, the teacher, of course, got very upset and banned cubes immediately, so we all had to learn how to do it. I'm sure a lot of you have had that experience. It's happened to me multiple times, actually. Um, and I didn't know cubing existed, though, as like a sport until 2012 when I finished college and found out there would be US national championship. And I reached out to Toby because he was organizing it. And I said, oh, can I come right? And he got kind of offended. He said, you're not going to compete? You're not going to compete? And I was like, well, on the one hand, maybe he wants my registration fee. But on the other, um, he had a valid point. Like, how can you write anything about cubing without doing it? And um, I started doing it. and. The more I started cubing and going to competitions and checking it out, the more I realized there was to know. Um, essentially, what this book arose out of was just a lot of questions um, that I'm sure some of you have had about, like, where did cubing come from? Where did the Rubik's Cube itself come from? Why has the cube remained so popular years after its invention? Um, and the more questions I asked, the more questions presented themselves, for instance, in trying to figure out the true story of who Mr. Rubik is and how he invented his cube. Um, because the more questions you ask about Mr. Rubik, the more he starts to look like his own puzzle because the different, the different sides don't really add up. Some people told me, oh, he owns one of the hills of Budapest or he lives in a castle with one floor for every one of his daughters uh, or he's the richest man in Hungary. And all of these things have grains of truth. He could easily have bought a large part of the country, in fact, back in the, in the 80s when, he, when he, this went to the market. Um, but to answer Colin's question more succinctly, um, I think a lot of us have had the experience if you read articles about cubing or you see videos produced by the media about cubing that fall flat in the sense that they you know, focus on feat solving or they don't really understand how it works. And to me, what was really lacking not so much as the actual facts was the sense that I know I've experienced that cubing is this amazing community that's so rich. It's like the puzzle itself. There's so many sides and there's so many different aspects people can engage in, whether it's speed solving, making new friends, doing FMC, doing what Lucas does, you know, just the sheer variety of presentations you've seen tonight testifies to the richness of this community. And I wanted that to be out there for people to find. Um, and I think as, in, is this, as is the case for many people who would embark on something, I mean, this took four years of my life. I wound up traveling like three continents. Um, you know, the only thing that can motivate you to do that is like you really want people to know something. And um, that's where this comes from. Yeah, can I add a little bit? So I've done a number of media appearances, and I've dealt with like how the media has portrayed cubing. And I've had, I think, in like the dozens of things that I've done and seen on the internet and so on, uh, only one that's actually done speed cubing justice, which was that Vox video. Right? And I was like very, very pleased and surprised by how all well that turned out. Um, this book is easily the best depiction of cubing that I've ever seen. And 
don't know, I, even as a speed cuber, I learned a lot, a lot more than I expected. And I thought that was really cool, given how little coverage this community has gotten. So. Thank you. Did you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, one, one thing about uh, as far as depiction of speed cubers goes is in this book is that um, a lot of the memories that Ian wrote about in this book were very similar to the memories that I had actually had back at, um, at World Championships where Mots and Felix were racing and uh, Felix ended up winning because of Mots' plus two. Um, the way Ian seemed to remember was very similar to the way I had uh, remembered it. And while, re while reading this book, I was kind of reliving those memories along with Ian. And I thought that was really interesting that even though he wasn't super into the speed cubing scene quite at, uh, at that time, you know, he still experienced it in much the same way that I had. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, oh yeah, and I had uh, a question for Ian. My question was, uh, I wanted to ask you about what your expectations or maybe hopes are for the impact that this book could have on the community in the future as far as he maybe helping it gain popularity or even making it go mainstream? Okay, so that's a complicated question, right? Because I'm sure there is many different perspectives and hopes and dreams about what cubing will accomplish or what it will become as there are people in this room. I've certainly talked to people who hope cubing will remain a very local community kind of focused thing that really has very little financial interest involved because when money gets involved in anything that changes things. And I've also spoken to other people who hope there will be more money involved so that, you know, competitions can be run professionally, people can get paid for running them, you know, you, if you want to be on a professional circuit, if such a thing would ever exist, that's a possibility. Um, so really, you know, th I tried to write a book that would be accessible not only to a general audience, to people who've like seen a YouTube video or like the guy sat next to on the plane today who saw me cubing and said, oh, my kids do that. And I was like, I have a story to tell you. Um, and, you know, it would be accessible for, for people like that who, you know, they've seen Stephen Brundage on America's Got Talent and suddenly they're like, wow, the cube is a thing again. I want to learn more about it. Or people have seen videos of Colin, Weston, Felix, et cetera. Um, but I also wanted to be something that like cubers would learn something about too. And I think the goal here was, I mean, if you can have multiple goals in the sense that, I mean, this book kind of is ready-made for puns about things having a lot of sides, right? Like the puzzle. Um, I wanted it to be as many things to as many people as it could be, um, which is in a sense a weak answer because if it's everything to everybody, it's nothing to nobody. But I wanted it to just bring this to people's attention and make people aware of some of the amazing stories in this. The, the unifying principle of this book, because it, it touches on things from the group theory Lucas talked about and the history of the WCA um, to the history of Rubik and the puzzle itself. A lot of people don't know, you know how it got out from behind the Iron Curtain. Ruin Rubik invented it. He was living at home with his mother in communist Hungary, making virtually no money. Um, and it took a Hungarian Holocaust survivor named Tom Kramer, who married into the British aristocracy and started a toy business. Um, finding it and found it at a German toy fair to bring it out to the Western world, which took him over half a decade and multiple times of approaching leading toy companies who rejected it over and over and over. Um, it's bringing stories like that out to the fore and showing people that, I mean, Colin actually asked me something when I, when I sent him a copy of the book. He said, why do you in this book not refer to the Rubik's Cube? I dropped the article, I would say Rubik's Cube. And what I said to him was, you know, no one says the Einstein's theory of relativity or the Higgs boson. You know, it sort of like obscures the history in this term. Like this is a puzzle invented by a certain person, just like Katsuyama's algorithm is invented by a certain person. And, you know, the world that we're all taking part in and that we're creating every time we get together in Cube is something that I wanted to both memorialize and create something that like people could look back on and be like, wow, like this is a world we're all a part of. This is a history we share and also present it in such a way that like going forward we can make the decision of where we want to take it because you know there's pros and cons to wherever cubing goes and i don't think that's a decision that can be made by any one person and this isn't you know a polemic or a work of um argument you know i'm, I'm trying to tell a story it's a work of nonfiction, and it's trying to give us a sense of where cubing has come from and you know, give a sense of where it might go. And I do talk to a number of people who talk about you know, the future of the competitive circuit. Ron Van Brueckham figures largely into this. I visited him in Holland and uh, as some of you may know, it's an interesting place, his apartment. His um, toilet paper roll holder is shaped like a Rubik's cube. Um, his, his partner Hanukkah made that. Um, so did that answer your question, Weston? Uh, yeah, I think so. Did you have anything to add? 
I don't think so. so okay. Yeah, so if any of you have questions, um, I'd be happy to take them about the book. It's being published by Simon & Schuster. It comes out on October 18th, which is my birthday, funnily enough. Um, I found out this week I'll be on Good Morning America and National Public Radio promoting it when it comes out. So hopefully you and your friends and family will hear about it that way as well. Um, so yeah, if any of you have questions about why I chose to do this, where it comes from, what went into it, what I learned, anything like that. Yes? Yes to all of those questions. Um, did you have another question? No, or, okay. The... Yes, okay. Um, <laughs> well, uh, there were a lot of hard elements of this. The unifying principle of the narrative is my journey to go sub-20, which Toby challenged me to do years ago. Um, I mean, literally in my summer camp yearbook, he didn't even say have a good summer or anything. He just said hit sub-20. And, <laughs> um, and at the time, I was, this was like 2005. That was practically impossible. I was like, well, fat chance, right? So. I taught some kids at school, got in trouble for doing it instead of schoolwork, and set it aside for a while. Um, so going sub-20 was a challenge in that I had a lot of bad habits to unlearn from cubing back in the old days with you know much slower cubes. Um, it took me, I actually get injured in the course of this narrative. I acquired Cuber's thumb, which has been so described in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's like a real medical condition. Some doctor wrote in back then, he was like, I thought I had gout, but actually not. It was, he stopped cubing, and then it's like, I've identified a new condition. Um, there's a whole chapter about, <laughs> about this. Um, I mean, in nonfiction, you don't really want to make yourself suffer if you're the protagonist, but suffering helps the story, so I guess it worked out for the best. Um, so it took me five months longer than I thought it would to go sub-20. I had budgeted a certain amount of time. I consulted gurus like Colin, um, even Jessica Friedrich. I went up to visit her in Binghamton and learned about her life story. Um, yeah, and Min Tai, actually, there's, there's a whole chapter, a whole chunk devoted to the, the first world champion, Min Tai, as some of you may have heard of. He, um, when I spoke to him, was running a wholesale fragrance business in East Los Angeles. Um, I mean, he's literally left the cube behind. He solves it 20 times before bed every night to keep his brain fresh, he says. That's like his rule. Um, and when I sat down with him, he like closed the door of his office and opened a cabinet as if he were going to pull out like a bottle of fancy whiskey, and he took out a cube. He's like, let's cube. <laughs> he just left all his employees outside. Um, he was really, he was like, how did you find me? I'm like, what? I just, I just asked Ron. It really wasn't that, that hard. So that part was easy. But um, the writing itself was very challenging. I mean, you know, uh, professional writing works by the word. So I had to turn in a manuscript of 75,000 words. And because I had less time to do it because of the cubing every day, that, that took longer to go sub-20. I had to, like, write more words the day after. But Tracking down Rubik was extremely difficult. Um, he actually gave us a blurb for the book, which is really exciting. We sent it to him, like the finished product, and he wrote back. Um, I have these little like palm cards and business cards I'll be handing out that give you like my website and social media stuff if you want to keep updated. But Rubik sort of you know, gave us his thumbs of approval. He said, Scheffler provides the first comprehensive book on the global phenomenon of speed cubing. Um, and pretty much every interaction I've had with Erno has been like, almost as if he were a ninja, which is actually not my description. Other people have described him this way to me. Um, when I went to meet him in Budapest, I didn't know I would meet him until the day before I met him. And I was just kind of waiting. Like, I pray to God this just is going to work out because I've come all the way to Europe. Um, and I mean, there were other people I was seeing, like Ron. But literally, the, like the day before we met, one of his people, because he's lots of people, um, was like, Mr. Rubik will meet you at 1230 tomorrow at this restaurant. And I was like. I will be there. <laughs> and then I got off a tram, and he was just looking at me. I mean, most people in Hungary think he's dead, which is kind of an interesting fact. Um, he's kind of gotten the best of both worlds, because he invented the world's most famous puzzle. And he's stayed so under the radar that he can just walk down the street, and everyone, like, no one recognizes him. You can go to Hungary. In Hungary, I spent a lot of time in Hungary and wrote about the sort of way the cube is part of the culture there in a way that's almost unimaginable here. Like, if you go to New York City, the Statue of Liberty stuff everywhere, right? Like licensed, unlicensed, you can get everything from like underwear to baseball caps. And that is actually, you can actually get Rubik's Cube underwear, so that's, that's true. Um, but you can get Rubik's Cube anything in, in Budapest. There's just street stalls like selling cube stuff. Um, and like in, in one of the, the oldest parts of the city, you can go and like pay a small amount of money to watch a film about the history of the country. The very first image is, is of a Rubik's Cube. I mean, Hungarians have invented everything from the ballpoint pen to, I think, the helicopter to various like, you know, important parts of electrical motors. Um, 
and you know what sticks in the national consciousness is like this is our thing is the Rubik's cube. So Hungarians are very aware of like this is a Hungarian thing, and they're also aware that people outside Hungary often don't know it's Hungarian. Um, but when I asked the woman running the exhibit, like, what do you know about its inventor? She said, oh, well, he's clearly a person in a Rubik. You know, some people don't realize it's a possessive. They misspell it R-U-B-I-X. Um, but she said, isn't he dead? And I said, I hope not, because I'm supposed to have lunch with them tomorrow. I hope they don't, we, I hope they don't wheel a corpse out. Um, so meeting Rubik was both a matter of chance and also just kind of... Um, you know, amassing. I felt sort of like a butterfly collector going around to all these people. And everyone I spoke to, I asked, have you met Rubik? And if so, what was your impression of him? And virtually everyone I spoke to said either things that contradicted each other or like, you know, he, like we saw him and then he disappeared like a ninja. Um, I mean, I'm not kidding. People have said this to me. So, you know, then I met him and it was a very interesting experience to like sit down and get to have an hour lunch with Erno Rubik at this restaurant in Hungary because I simultaneously felt a duty to like take all these notes to bring back to like share with all of you and anyone who reads this book about what he's like in person, like how his thoughts work. I brought puzzles that he'd never seen before because they've been invented by people in the puzzle design community to see, yeah, like find out what the cube means to him. And um, it uh, it was a challenge because like I also wanted to just sit there and have lunch with Erna Rubik, right? Like how many people get that opportunity? Um, and uh, you know, you, you can judge for yourself when you read, if, if you read the book, um, you know, what I learned from it, what you can learn from it. But, um, you know, it, it, it's a fact that, like, when we finished lunch, I had barely eaten because I was paying attention to him and taking notes and talking to him. And then I looked up and he, like, literally disappeared. Like, like I just was busy putting away my stuff and then he was gone. And I, like, walked out the door and, like, I couldn't see him. And he and his people had just disappeared. And I, I was just like, wow, okay, let's just, that's how that works. Um, <laughs> so, you know, he's, he's an interesting character. Um, and uh, I mean, in my mind, he's kind of like the Willy Wonka of Eastern Europe. That's, that's more or less who he is. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And any other questions? Okay. Cool. Um, oh yes, statue. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, the, so the question that statue asked was like, what other butterflies did you catch? What other, what other characters? What other, you know, people that maybe folks in the Cuban community have heard of but not met. Did you want to add something? No, I just wanted to say Jessica and... Uh, Dan Gosby. Dan Gosby so there's, yeah, so there are a number of people that some of you I'm sure have heard of but maybe not met, like Ron Van Brookham, Tyson Mao, Shotaro Makasumi. Um, I mean, it, it's almost ironic that some of these people, like Shotaro Makasumi, he's, he's my age, I'm, I'm 25, and he's a doctoral student at Stanford, and yet, because Cuban is so young, he's essentially Methuselah. You know, like, I mean, I've met Cubers who, who, who've said to me, like, you know, I've heard of Mackie, you know, as, as if he were, like, this great priest of a long dead religion. He's just down in Palo Alto. You know, you can go visit him. I'm sure he'd be happy to see a new Cuber. But um, interesting fact also, he does math that's so complicated, he couldn't explain it to me. Like, part of meeting everyone in the book is I give a portrait of them, like Jessica Friedrich, Miroslav Golian. I mean, ironically, Jessica now works across the hallway from her rival from the Czech, like back in Czechoslovakia. They were like, they went head to head against each other in the national championship. And in a very roundabout way, she wound up in the United States and worked for the Air Force, did like secret research in cryptography. Um, her real work is just as interesting as her Rubik's Cube work, frankly, it's, it's all kinds of puzzles. Um, and she told me the story about how this one man or young man from the Czech Republic was like her rival and then, you know, now he's, she's like, oh, you can talk to him. He's across the hall. I was like, are you serious? And he's actually behind, um, if you know anyone who's into making patterns on their puzzles, he calls them pretty patterns, like designing different, you know, ways to just shape the cube. He was, he was the first world record holder for fewest moves, actually. Um, he, from, he's an interesting character. He compared cubing to two extremely Soviet things. He said it was like ping pong and chess at the same time, which feels apt and yet also very of his time. Um, were there any other characters that you thought of or that you thought of? I mean, they themselves are butterflies in a sense, right? So they're, they're wonderful creatures. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I have question. Yes. Um, so you've met a lot of people, a lot of places. So two questions from all of them. Where have you seen the most passion for cubing in a geographical sense? And if you could pick a single person who is the most passionate person for cubing that you've met? OK, so Statue has two questions. Um, yes. I'm guessing Ron is the person. OK, well, so I'll, I'll, I'll get you in a second. So Statue asked, 
where of all the places I visited, because I went to a lot of different places for this book, where were people most passionate about cubing and which, like, which person of the people I met was most passionate? And Colin wanted to guess what my answers will be. I'm guessing it's Ron, but I'm really not sure. Okay. Just from your description. Did you want to guess, Weston? Mm, I would have to think a little bit. Okay. Lucas? Well, on a per capita basis, that is factually accurate because there are more Cubers in Poland per capita than any other country in the world, according to the WCA database. They punch above their weight in that dimension. Um, but honestly, so my answer may be dissatisfying to you in the sense that I don't think there's one place that, well, what makes Cuba unique is that everyone is really passionate. I mean, um, when I was in, I went to Sao Paulo for the World Championships last year in Brazil, and I don't know if any of you know the brothers Gutierrez Cuba, the twins from Peru. Um, the way they raised money to get to Worlds is literally insane. They um, decided to busk, which is not that unusual. Like, I'm sure any of us could make a good like amount of money in the New York subway system by like saying like, oh, look at this, I could never do it, it's so hard. Would you give me money if I can do it in two minutes? And you know, we'd clean up, right? Um, these guys went into traffic, like they literally would walk into streets in Lima, and at red lights, instead of selling flowers or like scrubbing the cars, they would just hold up their Rubik's Cube and stand in front of the cars they would scramble it and solve it during the red light, and people would throw money out the window, and they would pick it up and then wait for the next red light and do it. So I was listening to this and taking notes and kind of looking at Natan Riggenbach, the Peruvian Cuber, like, are you serious? And he's like, oh yeah, my daughter tried it too. And I was like, are you, are you okay with that? And he's like, no, it's great training, because like, you know, if you mess up a solve in competition, it's fine, but you could get run over by a car this way. It builds character. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, on the one hand, Poland, yes, has the most cubers per capita, and you know, there's certainly people here who are passionate about cubing. There's, you know, if you look at all the online communities that cubers have, there's people who are doing, there's, some, there's many ways to be passionate about it, right? You can make art out of Rubik's Cubes. I mean, there's a French street artist named Invader who makes, he calls it Rubik Cubism, which is at once utterly expected and yet kind of great. Um, there are people like Edward Snowden, who, as some of you may know, when he met the journalist to whom he leaked documents um, from the National Security, um, from the NSA, the only thing he told the journalists was look for the man holding a Rubik's Cube. He used to walk around the NSA solving Rubik's Cubes. That was like his thing there. Um, I didn't learn that. That's like a thing that's been previously reported, but a lot of people don't seem to have noticed. Um, so I think, frankly, the most passion is wherever the cube is, because it seems to inspire passion in everyone, who it, in everyone whom it touches. It's just got this kind of magical quality to it. Um, and as far as people, I think Ron does take the cake in terms of outward passion, because, like I said, his toilet paper roll holder, I mean, he's gone on record. He didn't say this to me, but he'll solve cubes on the toilet, and if a piece falls in, he'll like take it out. He told someone else that. I, I didn't prod that far. Um, but uh, you know, his, like, his, he's got some really fun things in the house. Like his partner Hanukkah makes cube art. She's won awards for it. She's got like a mix art out of wood. She's, she's done work for like the Dutch royal family. She's a great artist. Um, she's got like a wooden sardine tin. It's not really sardine tin, it's wood, but it's like full of cubes floating as if they were sardines. I think Ron was so proud when he showed it to me and it's great, it's called Hungarian sardines. Um, I mean, the fact that Ron and his partner and, you know, their extended families all cube says a lot for them in that regard. But, you know, people like Jessica are passionate about cubing, too. There's different ways to be passionate. I hope that's a satisfying answer. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much. And I also wanted to make an announcement, which is that we will be giving away advanced copies of the book to the podium winners in 3x3. Three three. So, happy cubing. Thank you very much, and good evening.